I want to start by uh, sharing a story with you. Let me first turn this, uh, turn this on. There we go. Uh, this comes from my own life. Uh, I grew up in Walnut Creek, California, and right next to our home was a commuter train called BART, or Bay Area Rapid Transit. It actually took some property from my parents in order to, to build it. And as I was a young kid, I remember seeing it get all built and the bridges and the uh, tracks put in all that. Well, they had promised my parents, oh, it would be a silent train since it was electric. Oh, that was far from the truth. It was quite noisy. And when it would go by, it would go by pretty quickly, only about 15 seconds for it to pass by our area and our house. But during those 50 seconds, it, or 15 seconds, it made so much noise that you could not hear the person talking next to you. And so about every 30 minutes, it would go right by. And then we just got in the habit of being used to that. And you would just stop the conversation for about 15 seconds. You just stop. And then you just carry on after that, like as if nothing happened. We got so used to that that it was as if it was invisible. It was like didn't even happen to us. It was just part of life. And, and we were desensitized to the noise. I remember one time, this happened more than on one occasion, but one time in particular there was this family that came over to visit with us, and it was their first time at our house. And so they came there, and we were in the middle of this nice conversation, and suddenly the BART train comes through. Rumble, 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 comes through. And we just, as a family, we just all stop talking, you know, wait. And then we're about to carry on the conversation. And the family we're with goes, whoa, what was that? Because they couldn't see it. They didn't know what was going on. Whoa, what, ha what just happened? And everyone in my family had the same response. We all go, what? We did not realize what had just happened. It was like, uh, it, we're so used to it that it didn't register. And they go, that rumbling, the, ru the, the sound, the shaking, all that. You know, what, what was that? Oh, that, yeah. That's the BART train. Yeah, every 30 minutes goes through and does that. And that, that's just the way it was. I tell you that story because I believe that there is a desensitizing in our, uh, in our culture to the principle that Jesus is going to explain to us today. That we have become so used to a certain aspect in our culture that we don't even notice it anymore. It's so prevalent. It's so common in our culture that we just ignore it. We just think it's just natural. It's just there. And the Christian church has adopted it as well. And what I'm talking about is the whole concept of of demanding your rights, demanding your rights, and I've got the right of free speech, I can post whatever I want on, on Facebook, it doesn't matter what other people think, it doesn't matter how many people I hurt, I'm just going to, you know, it's just my way, uh, this is my right. And it's so common, especially in our media, the news media does this, and uh, the politicians are always trying to stir people up. And that is not Jesus' way. And so we're going to look at a passage today which, at first glance, you could say this has nothing to do with us. It's about a temple tax. We don't pay a temple tax anymore. But the principle behind it, I think, is so valuable and needs to be taught and applied in our lives today because we've become so desensitized to, to this, this aggressiveness and even, even in the church, there's this, you got to stand up for what you believe. And I think what Jesus is going to teach us today is, no, most often you need to just sit down. You, you, you need to speak up your opinion. And Jesus is going to say, no, you just need to stay quiet. No, you need to demand your rights. And Jesus is going to say, no, you just need to be a servant. Oh, you just ignore the rule. It's a dumb rule. And Jesus is going to say, no, pay the tax. Pay it. Pay it. So listen, as I read this passage, this is continuing our study in the book of Matthew. Uh, this is the, the key phrase that I want you to remember so that you can put all this I'm going to say into just one sentence. I limit my freedom to serve like Jesus. I limit my freedom to serve like Jesus. 
Oh, you're catching on. You didn't, you didn't all get it, though, right? Right, okay. Here we go. One, two, three. I limit my freedom to serve like Jesus. All right, so this is the passage. Matthew chapter 17, starting at verse 24. Just listen as I uh, read. After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Well, yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus uh, was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon? He asked. From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own children or from others? Well, from others, Peter answered. Then the children are exempt, Jesus said to him. But so that we may not cause offense, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. This is a great passage. We're really going to get into this. We're going to study this. Again, we go back to this uh, idea, I limit my freedom to serve like Jesus. And I want you to really grasp that concept, so I'm going to have you do some hand motions. Yeah? Okay, come on. Here, you got to help me. Okay, so here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to make a fist. This represents your freedom, your rights. So you make your fist with, uh, you know, I'm doing it with my right hand. My freedom, my rights, but I limit my freedom, so I'm going to lower that. Now, I, I keep the fist, right? I'm, I'm I still have it. I still have my rights. I still have my freedom, but I'm lowering them. I'm limiting them. And then raise your other hand with an open hand. Serve. I'm going to serve like Jesus. So here we go. I limit my freedom to serve like Jesus. That's the principle. That's the point. So I'm going to go over three points, but the first two are connected. You can't just do the first point and forget about the second, right? So here's the first point that we're getting from this passage. As children of God, we are free from man-made rules and religious taxes. Jesus paid for our sins as the final sacrifice. Let me explain that from the passage. So what, what happens is that there's a temple tax. And for a Jewish man 20 years and older, every year they were supposed to pay a half shekel, two drachma. So it's a half shekel tax, and this is a, this is a rule, this is a regulation, it helps support the temple. And so Jesus is not in one single spot, he's wandering around, right? So he could probably get away with, without paying it. And so the collectors of this tax come to Peter. Does your teacher pay? Does he pay this tax? <laughs> we're collecting, right? And Peter, just like probably you and I would do, oh, yeah, yes, of course, he doesn't, he doesn't really think about it. He's probably not even going to talk about it later. But he just says what's going to make them happy. Oh, yes, of course he pays, yes. Uh, he's paid somewhere else, probably. <laughs> so, yes, he pays. So that's the, the context of it. And then he comes back, and Jesus speaks first. So God miraculously uh, knows what is going on, the conversations that we have, right? And if we make a promise, we should keep it. Oh, that's one of the little nuances here. So uh, Peter comes in and Jesus then tells him that the children are free. He uses this analogy of earthly kings, right? You, you know that, remember the story. So an earthly king, who do they collect taxes from? Do they tax their own children? What's the answer? No, no, they tax their subjects, right? They're the ones that pay the taxes. So the children are exempt or the children are free from paying the taxes. Now, Jesus is using this analogy to illustrate that Jesus, as the Son of God, Peter and the disciples, as children of God, are exempt. The temple isn't that important anyways, because Jesus, he even said this earlier, he's greater than the temple. Jesus is actually going to do away with all the sacrificial system, right? Right? Are you going to need to do animal sacrifices? No, you know, not, no it's going to be obsolete. Who's the ultimate sacrifice? Yeah, Jesus. He's the last one. He's the final sacrifice. 
So we really don't need the temple. We don't need to do those animal sacrifices anymore. Jesus is above all that. He's a, you know, we're, we're children of God. We are free. We're exempt from that. And he uses that illustration of the earthly king. Children don't, of the king don't have to pay taxes. And you and I, children of God, we don't have to pay the temple tax. We don't have to follow all these rules and regulations and rituals. We're free. Now that's a point I want to make very clear. We are free. There's a freedom in Christ. This is talked about by Paul as well. We have a great freedom in our faith. Now remember the Pharisees, they lived by the rules, right? They lived under all these obligations, these rules and regulations, and you have to wash your hands a certain way, and you had to do this and do that and do, do all these things. But as Christians, as Christ followers, we are free from all those. Now we're not free from the moral laws. I, I want to make that clear. People get this confused. Now, the moral laws, like Jesus summarized the, the two greatest ones. Love God. You know, love God with all your heart, soul, strength, mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. The summary of all the laws. Those are moral laws. Keep doing those. Right? Keep, Jesus wants us to do those. That's how you show love for God. It follows Ten Commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not lie. All those things are moral laws. We still follow those to show our love for God. But we're free from all the man-made rituals, obligations, and things like uh, you can't heal on the Sabbath. Remember how Jesus got in trouble all the time? You know, he's healing on the Sabbath and people would get mad at him. That was man-made rules. And there's all these rituals, all these regulations that Jews had to keep up with. And as Christians... Jesus is saying, you're free from that. We're free. And you know how churches are and religious organizations? We always like to make rules. It just happens over time. We make more and more rules. This is another rule. This is another rule. And grab hold of this understanding. As a Christian, you have a relationship with God. You're following God. You're not following a, 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 a man-made religion or a set of doctrines or a set of rules, you walk in a relationship with God, which is very freeing. Very freeing. You're so free. It's like free from all these obligations and, oh, I just have a relationship with God and that's what's important. Get that? You understand that point? That's a good point. But are, am I, are we done? That you're just free? No. All right, there's more to it, which uh, I, I, want, I want to remind you. I, what's this? My freedom. I limit my freedom. To serve. Let's all do it. Okay, here we go. I limit my freedom, lower it, to serve like Jesus. There's a second part to this. Here's the second part. Even though we are free to break a certain rule, we still obey it so that we don't offend people. If you look at the passage, it's very clear. So Jesus, so the children are exempt. This is verse 26. So the children are free. They're exempt. They don't have to pay the tax. They don't have to follow all these rituals. Jesus said to him, but so that we may not cause offense, pay the tax. So that we may not cause offense, go ahead and pay the tax. And I feel I really got to get this point across. This is, this is vital to our society today. Okay, so... We are free, but we don't want to purposely offend people and make them uh, turn against God because we're not going through what they expect. Now, an, an example of that is like the, the, the tax collectors, the two drachma tax collectors. If, if, they, if Peter said, no, Jesus doesn't pay that, he doesn't have to, they would be offended. They would go, well... You know, Jesus doesn't support the temple. Obviously, he's not in favor of God. The temple and God go together. And this is terrible. Jesus is a terrible person. And so God loves those people too. God is concerned for the tax collectors too. And he doesn't want them isolated or, or offended so that they won't believe. He wants them to believe too. And so that's, that's an example of 
of what it was talking about. So that we don't offend them, we're going to go ahead and pay the tax. We're going to do what's right. We're going to be uh, responsive to that. And, and, and so that's just, that's just uh, one point I want to make. Uh, Jesus, does not, Jesus wants to avoid making a bad impression that could keep people away from God. And the same is true for us today. Think about that you represent Christ, that you are an ambassador for Jesus. And when people see you breaking rules and going around things and not paying your, your uh, licenses and stuff like that, it gives a bad impression of Christians. It gives a bad impression of your witness. And so even though you might not have to do something, that you have a freedom not to do it, you, 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 you go ahead and do it. You go ahead and pay it. Just so you can have a good witness. Right? We want to have a, a nice witness for Jesus representing him. Now I'm going to press this. I think this also means that we need to really question whether we get involved in protests. Now maybe God's really leading you to get involved in a protest. Or to sign a petition. But think about that. If the principle here is that we don't want to offend people, we want to be a good witness, you really have to be prayed up to know that God really wants me to be a part of this. And in our culture, that's just so opposite. Everybody's protesting things all the time. Right? It's, it goes the same with posting stuff on the internet. People post things that offend people all the time. And they think it's their freedom of speech. And it's, yeah, I can say whatever I want. But listen, it's, it, it can really hurt people. And if you're representing Christ, what kind of a witness is that? When you post something that's uh, maybe angry and hateful, and I see it all the time. It's like that train. And we don't even notice it. That No, a Christian really shouldn't be doing this. You know, I, I know that even as... Like substitute teachers and, and teachers, they can get fired for what they post online. I just found that out. Yeah, they think, oh, it's only what they do at school. No, no, you can get in trouble for what you post at home. And how much more should it be for a Christian believer uh, that, that you're representing Christ? Be careful in what you're communicating out there so that you don't intentionally offend people. Now, you can't avoid offending people. Some people get offended easily at anything. But I'm talking about intentional. Intentional. Okay, so there are examples of the opposite. Let me balance this. There are plenty of examples in Scripture of actually standing up and confronting people. One example would be Paul in Galatians 2 had to confront Peter. Peter was doing something that was wrong and... Paul publicly confronted him. There's times to do that. Jesus, at times, confronted the Pharisees. And he'd tell them off publicly. You know, he confronted them. Uh, there's a, a, in Acts chapter 4, the disciples are told, don't preach anymore in the name of Jesus. Stop it. That's the authorities commanding them to do that. And they say, well, we have to obey God rather than man. So they continue. So there are times that you need to Buck the system, stand up for your rights, and, you know, just go ahead and, and uh, cause some conflict. But I would say those are more the exception. I would say in many, many more cases, what Christ is asking us to do is to back off. What Christ is asking us to do is, is, is surrender. Surrender your rights. Give up your opinion and stay silent. Instead of blasting people and trying to change everything, just... Take it. Just back off. That's what he's saying here. This is a principle that Paul also teaches. I want us to read this. Paul teaches the same thing. And this is a summary verse. Paul talks about it in Galatians, also in Romans. This is a summary, Galatians 5.13. I want you to read this with me. Here we go. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. But through love, become slaves to one another. So Paul goes into great detail explaining how oh, we're free in Christ. We don't have to obey all these rituals and uh, regulations of the Jewish people. No, you're free. You're free, brothers and sisters. But 
Do, do not use your freedom as an opportunity to just do whatever you want and offend as many people as you. It doesn't matter how many people I offend. It doesn't matter. So don't use it for self-indulgence, but actually become slaves. So it's the same thing. It's just another way of saying the same thing. So, so I have my freedom, my freedom, my rights. Okay, here we go. Right, let's see the hands. Okay, I have my, I, I limit my freedom to serve like Jesus. That's what we do. That's what we do. That's the principle here. Now, I, I want to not only talk about this verse, you know, and leave this verse up, but I want to give you examples. A way of principle is, is the principle can be, it's like a coat. And you know, there's a whole lot of pegs that you can hang that coat on. It can go on this, it can go here, it can go here. Go. It's the same principle, and I'm going to give you seven different examples, seven different coat pegs that you can hang this on. And these are things that I was just thinking of to apply this principle to our life right now. All right. So the first one, first example I'm going to talk about is one that Paul gives. In uh, the book of Romans, uh, chapter 14, he talks about this. In his day, there was a conflict with meat that had been offered to idols in a sacrifice and then sold at the regular meat market. So Christians were divided on this subject. Now, if I buy meat that's been sacrificed to an idol, can I eat it or not? Is it a sin to eat meat that has been sacrificed to an idol? And some Christians thought that was a sin, and other Christians thought it was okay. And so Paul explains that. that you could have two different views on this. Paul says some people think it's a sin, others don't. And he said, in the, this is how I would do it, he says, don't ask. Don't say hey, you're about to buy meat. Hey, was this meat sacrificed to an idol? Don't even ask. Just, just, just go ahead and buy it. <laughs> and you can eat it with a free conscience, right? But if someone tells you you got some meat there and someone, uh, another Christian brother says, hey, that meat was sacrificed to an idol, then don't eat it. Not for your sake, but for their sake. Because they think it's sin. All right, so that's one example. I'm going to modernize that. It's be like this today. Alcohol. Okay, there are some Christians that drink socially, and that's all right. Jesus turned water into wine, right? There are other Christians that are very much opposed to any kind of alcohol because maybe they had a, a relative that became an alcoholic or it was really bad in their family. So no alcohol, right? So that's in our day and age. There's people, no alcohol, and there's other people, oh, yeah, social drinking's fine. Here's the thing, though. Out of love, you might have the right to drink alcohol at your house. But if you invited someone to come over for dinner who was a recovering alcoholic, you would limit your right. Because you know, recovering alcoholics, if they have even one drink, they will fall off the wagon. They'll go back into the alcoholism. Even one drink. And so they're at your house, and, and you're like, well, I like the social drink. I'm going to have alcohol, and I'm free. Yeah, you, you're free to do it, but you limit your freedom for the sake of the other person, for that, so, that they, so that they're not tempted with the alcohol. So that's a second example. Here's another example. It comes from my experience living next to Las Vegas in Nevada. All right, so in Las Vegas, there's a lot of casinos, and they have great buffets. So I was new there, I was trying to get to know people, and one of the guys in my church, I invited out to lunch. And I said, hey, let's meet at such and such uh, uh, casino for lunch, because they have a great buffet. And I remember he told me, Brent, can we meet somewhere else? Because I'm a recovering um, um, gambling uh, addict. And he says, I cannot step into a casino. And, and I could have said, oh, we're not going to gamble. We're just going to go to lunch there. We're just going to walk past all those slot machines. You know, we don't have to stop at them. You know, I'm, I'm free from that. I, I, I never was tempted by gambling in, in, when I lived there. And so I could have pressed my freedom onto him. And said, no, no, we're going to meet there. No, but I didn't because I was going to limit my freedom in order to benefit him, in order to serve like Jesus. In order so, that, so we met somewhere else. We met at a restaurant that didn't have slot machines, right? For his sake, 
That's, that's an example. All right, so I, I have some other examples here. Here's another one. I remember uh, back in Nevada at my other church, uh, there was a guy that constantly was telling me to preach politics from the pulpit. He was constantly badgering me to tell people how to vote. And of course, his political views were God's views too, of course. And he thought I was going to just tell what everyone thought and you know, he was right and then this is the way you should preach. Well, I know politics is very divisive. And I refused. And he would just get on my case. You know, it's your obligation to lead the people and you've got to tell them how to vote. And I was like, why offend people? There's people with different political views. There's no point in that. My goal is to teach the word of God. Now, if God's word offends people, I can't help that. But I'm not going to purposely try to upset people. I'm going to stay out of it. So I would not talk. And you've known me a year and a half. I don't preach politics. I stay away from that subject. Because it's so divisive. And I really feel my, my philosophy and my, my goal and my focus should be on Christ. Because ultimately, in the end, the donkey nor the elephant is going to be the solution to our problems. But there is a Lion of Judah that is the solution. There's the Lamb of God, and that is the one I want to focus on, and the one I want to preach, and the one I want to promote, and the one that really is going to not just save our souls, but He can transform our lives and transform our whole country. And so that's, that's another example of how you apply this. Don't intentionally offend people. Now, you can unintentionally offend them. It happens. You can't avoid that. So here's, here's another example. Now, these, right, I'm hanging the, the principle on all these different coat pegs, right? Here's another way to hang this principle. Uh, okay, this is... In Nevada, this is an example of one of many. In Nevada, in Boulder City, you had to get a license to do a yard sale. Yeah, and you were limited to two a year. So you have to go downtown to the office, fill out this paper. Now, it was free. It didn't cost you anything to, to get this license. But you had to do it or you were breaking the law. So our church, you know, every year we had a yard sale. And I, I remember when you forgot and it was like, oh, man, you know, the office is going to close in 10 minutes. i got to rush down there. It's a Friday and we're going to do it on Saturday. I've got to rush down there and fill out this paperwork. And, of course, I did. Filled out the dumb form. Why do we do this, right? It's our own property. Well, why do we do it? Because we should. So as we don't offend people. Oh, that church, oh, they, they didn't fill out the form. They must, you know, they must be rebellious uh, people. So we just do it. So do you get your license, um, you know, registration for your car, for your kayak? Do you get the little sticker for your kayak? You got to do all that stuff. Even though it might be a hassle, we do it. Because it's the right thing to do. Here's, here's another example. I've been involved in the National Day of Prayer for many years. In Nevada, I was part of the, the ministerium and uh, we'd organized this. And many, many years I did this. <clears throat> so one year, there was about eight pastors. We were all going to take turns praying. And it was outside the library in an amphitheater. And the library was set up, the stage was set up so... The time we did this was terrible. We were looking right into the sun. It's like 5 o'clock. The sun was just right in your eyes. And so one of the new pastors to the area, young guy, was wonderful. He came two hours earlier that day. It was so hot. He helped set up everything. And, and he was just sweating like crazy and, and just gave and gave and gave to help this thing work out well that day. And he was one of the prayers. And he got up to pray on the stage and he was wearing short pants and he was wearing a baseball cap. And he gave his prayer and then, you know, you know sat down and, then, you know, other people gave their prayers. There was only one letter about the National Day of Prayer that made it into the newspaper. It was this lady that was completely upset. And she said, so-and-so, pastor so-and-so wore a baseball cap while he prayed and he was wearing shorts. It was so disrespectful. That was the only letter 
about the National Day of Prayer. And it just, it just hurt him so bad. He didn't know. Now, I remember my wife, I was about to wear shorts, and she said, no, Brent, don't you wear shorts. This is a prayer event. You know, you'll offend some people. So I know you don't wear a baseball cap when you're... But just really, does God care? If you're praying sincerely from your heart, does God really care if you're wearing a baseball cap? No. That's an American custom. That's our tradition. But she had to state her opinion. She had to write her letter. It's wrong. She was probably a Christian. But it's completely wrong. Why couldn't she just stay silent? Why couldn't she or just phone the guy and say, hey, next time you do this, it offends some of us when you wear a baseball cap when you're praying. You know, just... And, and now, he would have been wrong if someone had said, oh, don't wear a baseball cap when you're praying or you'll offend some people. Well, I'm going to wear one anyways. I don't care. I don't care. They're, they're wrong. God doesn't care if I wear a baseball Now, that would have been a wrong attitude, right? But we limit our freedoms, right? Don't... We limit our freedoms. What? We're going to lower it? Oh. In order to what? Serve like Jesus. That's what we do. Okay, last, last example. Okay, last example. I, I'm really having fun. Can you tell? I, I'm like passionate about this because I think it's a big problem. It's a big problem in our society. And, and so the, here's the last, um, Copeg, here's the last illustration. All right, so... Uh, a lot of churches have worship wars. Okay, worship wars. It's been going on for like the last 20 years. All right, so churches have transitioned, a lot of them, from hymns to praise songs. And this has caused so many problems. I mean, not just, not just in this church, everywhere, right? So it's like, oh, and some people get all upset. Oh, well, we want to sing hymns. We only want to sing praise songs. And it's just, it's just wars, and you're just talking about a style difference, right? A musical style difference. And Jesus would say, relax. Surrender your rights. Surrender your opinion for the sake of the unity of the whole. For the sake of the body of Christ. Just give in. Just give in. And don't cause a big ruckus and commotion and, and problems on that issue. That's just another example of this surrendering Surrendering your rights. Now, I've talked long enough, but I, <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta get to this one more point, okay? I gotta get to this. A coin and a fish. All right. So, so Jesus needs Peter to pay the tax. It's a half shekel. So, uh, one shekel would pay for both Jesus and Peter. Okay. Why couldn't he go to Judas, who held the money bag, right? Hey, give Peter a shekel. Why, why, do you, why couldn't he go to... Right, Judas was the money keeper. Hey, Judas, give him a shekel. He's going to go pay a tax for us. But no, he doesn't do that. Peter, go to the lake and throw in a line. The first fish you pull out, it's going to have a coin in its mouth. And pay it with that. Now, I got it. I like this. I, I can't just miss this. Okay, last point here. God, when you act out of love, God will do miracles on your behalf. I think that's what it's saying. That God is this amazing creative God and that you do the right thing. You maybe don't have the money but you're going to pay uh, for that, that license and you think it's ridiculous or you're going to pay for that. You're going you're to pay for that because it's the right thing to do. It's following the law. Now you're going to do this. You're going you're to do the right thing and God will back you up. He'll, he'll step in in creative ways. I really think this. I really think this is the point here. It's a, there's a fish. There's a coin in it. You're going, this is so bizarre. But God does things like that. He will supply when you need it the most. I, I, I know that Ann and I really were, when we first started our ministry in Nevada, we needed a second car. She was going places. I was going places. It was a real struggle. And we didn't have the funds uh, to, to buy a second car. You know, we were financially strapped. And uh, this lady from the church, just out of the blue, this lady from her church said, hey, um, I'm going to give you my car. She's moving into a retirement uh, community that didn't allow them to have cars. And she, I'm going to give you a car. She gave us a car we used for seven, 16, 17 years. When we left Nevada, we gave it to someone else. It's still running. 
It was just like wonderful, out of the blue, God provided. We we're trying to serve him. God says, oh, okay, lady, you give him. Okay, here's, a, here's another example. I know a guy in Nevada, and he was going to do the right thing, but he needed money. He, was, he didn't have the money to do it. And he said, Brent, you won't believe it. I, I, you know, I wanted to do this. I was going to do it. I didn't have the funds to do it. I got an inheritance that was just the amount I needed from a relative I barely knew who put me in his inheritance. And he got, got all this money. He says, I barely knew this guy. I don't, it just came out of the blue. Here's a really strange one. Okay, so this is in Nevada, right? A lot of gambling goes on. So a Saturday at the men's Bible study, this guy comes up to me from my church. He gives me $100. He says, Brent, give this to someone who needs it. $100? Wow, that's great. Well, it's my tithe. Uh, I was gambling last night and I won $1,000. So here's 100 of it to give to someone in need. <laughs> so I gave it to somebody in need who came to my mind right away. And that person says, oh, this is just exactly the amount I needed. I've been praying for this. So God heard a prayer, had another guy win in gambling. I mean, stranger things have happened, right? And God sometimes has money in the mouth of a fish. So God will provide. Here's the bottom line. You do what you're supposed to do. You do what's right. Do what's proper. You know, withhold your rights and just serve other people. And God will come through for you. God will, God will back you up with, with these things. Uh, I limit, okay, here we go, last, last time. Here we go. I limit my freedom to serve like Jesus. So follow the rules, pay your taxes, and fill out the paperwork, do what's proper so that you can represent Jesus. Because bottom line, it can be wrong to use your rights. Let's pray. It's all, it's all about you, Lord. I just, I want to live for you. I want to follow the teachings of Jesus. And I know oftentimes that means to give up my rights and hold, hold back on my opinion, to be quiet and just serve. And I pray, Lord, you give us wisdom when we do need to stand up and confront people and confront things. That does happen. But in general, Lord, as this train goes by and our society is just loudly blowing again and again, this demanding of rights, this offend people, any, anybody, and, and say whatever you want, that train, we've got, become so used to it. And I pray you'll sensitize us to folks, that you'll sensitize us to, to listening to them, loving them, out of a pure heart, out of a, a heart that just wants to please you and just wants to do what's right. Lord, even though doing what's right means giving up our rights. So I just, I just want to give this uh, over to you, Lord. And, and I pray if there's anyone here that uh, needs prayer right now, that they'll come up afterwards and, and get prayer. Uh, I, I ask, Lord, if anyone really wants to commit their lives to you, that they'll come talk to me and just make that commitment, get baptized, and, and, and just really follow you with all their hearts. That's what it's all about. We're not here to just go through rituals and sing songs. We're here to connect to you. We want to experience you. We want to love you. We want you as part of our lives, fully engaged in living a life for you. In Jesus' name.